Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. I'm excited to have you here and excited for our guest. Again, today is another expert day where we get to talk to people who are experts in their field and helping you grow your practice with the best practices possible. My name is Dino Watt, as always, and I'm glad to have you listening again. Remember, if this is your first time listening, welcome to the show. If it is not and you've gotten any value out of this show whatsoever, make sure you share it with your friends and colleagues so they too can get the best practices in their practice. Today, we have a guest that I've known for a while that I've been trying to get on the show for a while, but you know, she's such a big deal that it's hard to nail her down. And she's flying all over the world doing amazing things. It's Michelle Shimon. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi, Hi good morning. Well, Michelle Shimon with Shimon Consulting. Today, we are going to focus on the full team approach to growing your practice. We're going to talk a lot about that because that is your expertise. But before we do, we always love to find out your story. How did you get into this crazy world of consulting and even just into the dental ortho world in general? Oh, what a great question. You know, um, when I look back and totally... um, kind of, what do you call it? The typical answer. But when I had braces on, I loved going to my orthodontist. Mm. And I actually thought the chairside technicians were the coolest gals ever. And I would just, I would say, I want to do that one day. And I remember as I was getting ready to go into high school, I was just probably hounding my orthodontist. How do I do what they're doing? How do I do what they're doing? And um, actually this June will be 30 years. So they, uh, you know, it was a matter of him bringing me on and training me on the job. And uh, one summer he just said, you know, uh, come, I was in high school and he said, come on in and um, I want you to work for me through the summer and then after school uh, for the after school rush. And so I, I started there and I, I was obviously before I turned 18. And as I turned 18, the law had changed that you had to be 18 to actually work on patients. And so it's just timing for me worked just fine. I didn't have wow. any hiccups with that. And I have just stayed in the industry. Although uh, in college, I thought I was going to be a counselor. So I uh, studied psychology and ended up getting married and having a family and staying in the fantastic industry. So, yeah. Nice. So as you said that you loved it so much, I remember that I remember being in the chair and thinking that the, the assistants, like what a cool job they had, like I'll be in those mouths, but I I don't know why I'm going to ask this and, and I might be wrong, but I just imagine that it either like a Halloween or for some reason or another, did you ever dress up in scrubs? Because I could just imagine. <laughs> I never did. You never did that. Oh. I did not. <laughs> I could see you like being like, oh, wow, this is be such a clever thing. Carrying around a hemostat. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's actually creative. I I, I was, I, yeah, I figured you like, oh, in high school, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm projecting there. <laughs> So you first started out in Chairside. One of the unique things about you uh, from your bio and from listening to you speak before is that you've actually gone through pretty much all the positions in an office. I have, except the one that has DR in front of it. So well, uh, that's not a big deal. Nobody <laughs> really. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, so over the last uh, almost 30 years now, I have had the privilege of being able to actually work in the trenches uh, for every position in the practice and uh, extensive um, experience in management and financials and sales treatment coordinating. That was the area that I was very, very passionate about and moved into mm. quickly. Um, I, my heart is training and coaching. And I always, I feel that once I got into the industry, I knew that I wanted to go into consulting and I knew that it was a strategic path. Um, I was young enough to know that I could put myself on that trajectory and I uh, just every day feel so blessed that I have this opportunity. You know, I did before I moved out of clinical, I did for two and a half years, I um, trained orthodontic assisting chairside and uh, that was a great opportunity as well. So I just, I love teaching. I love coaching and teaching. So, and- so it's, a, it's an interesting path, right? Because um, there are definitely a lot of uh, assistants, mm-hmm. treatment coordinators, uh, support uh, staff who actually would never, ever, ever in their life think about teaching this mm-hmm. or speaking in front mm-hmm. of people. I mean, speaking alone is such a challenging thing. Consulting, 
you know, going out on your own, being entrepreneurial. So what, what built that drive and passion for you? Was it just something that does innate or? I think so. <laughs> I think that I'm very good at it naturally. It just makes sense to me. And I feel that I have a natural ability to connect with people that is necessary when you are coaching and influencing their behavior and their, and I, I, I think that's where my heart for being a counselor comes in as well. Although I look back often now and I'm like, Hey, I, I kind of am a counselor. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Right. So yeah, it's good. It's, so, good. So but you're right, it's not everybody. And as you know, I mean, getting up on stage, that is definitely not for everybody. And it's, I'm right at home. I love it. It's, I mean, I don't think I'm as comfortable as you are on stage, but oh. I love, love, love coaching. I think you're doing pretty, I think you're doing just fine. I think you're doing just fine. That's awesome. Well, okay. So now you've gotten it. You, you took all of this information, this knowledge that you have, you transitioned that into the consulting space, wanting to help people. I think it's interesting that there's that background, that mental background, right? Of like being a counselor of really that the whole idea there is to help is to be a support system to let people see maybe things that they're not seeing because you're not standing in their jar of their office every single day. Right. And that's such a huge benefit to people. Um, how did you decide on the specifics of the area you wanted to go into? Because you really do help them see this full team approach around what they're doing, helping their team kind of get on board and become, as I call their advocates. Yeah, absolutely. You know, great question. I think that happened organically as I, it, it was about a, 10 years ago that um, nine years ago that I came into actually consulting and lecturing and training. And at the time, and even now, I believe um, everybody kind of had their specialty yeah. Uh, yeah. sales exam, a TC or clinical. Mm -hmm. And what I found and with my background in, in mastering all of those areas, they are all so interrelated and intertwined. I can come in and train a team on how to close every case with sales and influential communication. Uh, but if you don't have your clinical efficiencies and protocols in place, or if you don't have your scheduling protocols in place or your financial systems and protocols in place, your practice is absolutely not gonna see the benefit. So I, I feel organically it grew in the fact that I recognized when I can address a practice holistically, their entire business sense from A to Z is when we really get the greatest results. And I really created um, my business strategy that way for uh, the best results out of our clients. And I, it's working really, really well. So people ask me what I specialize in and I know the business of orthodontics inside and out. And I go in and, you know, I don't want to turn their practice upside down. I want to enhance what they're doing well. And I want to identify the areas where there's room for improvement and partner with their team members on that approach. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because you're right. I think uh, when people get into any type of consulting, it's like, okay, well, what's the specialty? What's the focus? Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're working in one area and you're not focusing on another area, it's like driving a car and having a flat tire. It's like, exactly great, you right. got three great tires, but you got one that's yeah. not, and you're still not going to go where you want to go. Right. Um, especially not as fast as you want to go. So that's great. So when you took this dive into the consulting world, I'm sure there weren't a lot of people that were very surprised about it, right? There, were, you had support systems, you had people who were like, Absolutely. oh yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. I'm very blessed and grateful for the team I have and just everybody that I have in my corner. Yeah. And the way that your company works, you actually, what's cool is you also have different perspectives of other people who are on your team as well, right? Because you have other people who have been in the industry, you screen them that way. It, it just makes it to where when people are hiring you as a company, mm -hmm. they're getting a lot of information, a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, experience. Resources. Absolutely. I have, and I say this, you know, and it's so authentic and deep in how I feel. I have the greatest team. I've got eight team members alongside me. And really what it is, is just such a broad resource for our clients and our industry, because I am able to really find 
the greatest minds in our industry across the country. My team is spread out across the country and I have specifically targeted those individuals and uh, the strategy that we put together on behalf of all of our clients. I sure can't do that on my own. Um, And I work really hard to empower my team members because I think it can be hard to come on and work under Michelle Shimon. And I hope that none of my team members ever feel um, that they are anything but alongside as, you know, um, as a resource for our clients. And it's just work really, well, really. Well, I'm sure that is very, it's probably super reflective in what you actually do for your clients because you do that so. inside of your own business as well. I hope so. So you have that, that do that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about why, uh, what you see. Let's, let's talk about a couple of the problems that you see when it comes to not utilizing your team with that full team approach. So you had mentioned a moment ago about how it's so important uh, if the, the great, you're closing great, great uh, sales with your TC, but you don't have something else set up, whether that be in your finances or great clinical. Uh, right. I, when I talk about this, I talk about the idea that there's really only two positions in any business. It's sales and sales support. So you're either selling Amen. something or you're supporting that sale before or after, like making mom go, oh, we made the good decision or we should make right. the good decision. So as you've seen out there, there are not always, there's not always that attitude. There's not always the attitude. Sometimes there's doctors who are just, who are very um, divisive in the way that they are actually looking at the different team members. So how, why do you think that is, first of all, let's talk about that. Why do you think that some don't see that as it's a full team approach? You know, I, it boggles my mind. I have <laughs> no idea. And I think that, I mean, I, I just feel such a deep connection to you because our, our messaging and that level of understanding about the importance of culture mm-hmm. and building your teams and empowering your teams is where it's at. Yep. I, if there is one key ingredient to the recipe of a practice success, it lies right there. And I just was in Atlanta this last weekend lecturing on that entire process. And I'll tell you, I I have so many examples of where we've implemented this and it's worked and, and, or it's natural with the doctor and the team. We all can see it with our friends, colleagues online and social media, but it works when, you know, leadership starts from the top you know, and it's a very humble position. It should be a very humble position in a practice, Mm -hmm. but um, it's, that's the key ingredient to the success of a business. And it is baffling that people, um, Mm -hmm. I I, I say this often where people will self-sabotage, right? It's like you, you have the opportunity to have this support system Mm -hmm. and these people, and, and, you know, look, sometimes it's because they've gotten burned before, or they've had a a high turnover with people that they, they have trained and spent time and effort into it. So they pull back and you can see that in relationships in general, let Mm -hmm. alone as a leader, but getting them to understand the power of the, the advocacy that they could have Mm -hmm. in their practice by letting go of, of that, oversight and that that having to grab tightly to all the reins how do you approach this with doctors or um, business owners and help them see and get over those hurdles that they have mentally in there with that with that attitude sure great question so I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that um, you know there there's a challenge with them being able to give this lane to a team member that they've chosen to hire and let them fly. Mm-hmm. Um, this is definitely a, an approach that I feel is different in the industry of consulting firms and how I approach our, our practices and our clients. When you can provide clarity through very clear direction, expectations, um, what report am I going to run when, who's running it, how they're running it. Um, You provide that clarity. It sets the team member up to be successful. Give them that lane. Let them fly. We have deadlines and it delivers a high level of accountability. Most importantly, I don't want to ever make a recommendation or a decision off of a feeling or a perception. I want to look at the metrics you know, I might really like this person. They might be a great person, but they just might not be right for this job. Right. Let's look at the metrics. Let's look at the results that we're getting out of those clear expectations that we have set. And, you know, I, in a lot of my lectures, 
I talk and I reference sports analogies. Been big in my family as I've raised my two sons, but um, sports teams run so much better than most orthodontic offices Mm -hmm. because they have those playbooks. They have the training and the conditioning. Uh, They know where the finish line is. They're coached to not only cross the finish line, but cross the finish line first. And they know what's in it for them when they cross that finish line. So that's what is key. And one, I did ask a doctor um, who was really struggling in this area. Trust is a, definitely a factor in that. And I recognize that as a business owner, and I'm sure you can as well. This is a livelihood that we have put everything into. And we essentially are handing over the keys to team members and and I asked this doctor, I said, you know, what, what are you concerned? He, and the doctor said, I'm afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of balls getting dropped. I'm afraid of something not happening properly or not happening at all. And, and then I just went step by step through. I said, okay, let, again, let's look at the business from A to Z. We're not dropping any piece. This is getting done by this person, by this time. At that time, we get to check in and recognize if it was done, if it was done properly or not, and make then those decisions on which direction to move. So it's so important. And it's so important for you to help them uh, see that path because, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, again, you're back to the counseling, right? <laughs> you, you are, um, you're having to see things for them, help them trust in different ways, help them um, kind of just go out on that limb. And the, the problem is, is that it is not just, it's not just their livelihood, but no one taught them how to right. think like this through school. Right. As we as as doctors go through their training, they are taught how to solve a problem Mm -hmm. in that specific area there. They become tacticians in a really powerful way. You know, in the orthodontic world, they're obviously top of their class in many ways and they can figure out the problem. And when it comes to teeth, when it comes to that one millimeter difference, they can see it when it comes to people. Mm-hmm. If they weren't taught that, we, my wife always tells me, uh, reminds me about how uh, she was talking to a, a doctor probably about four years ago. And, um, you know, it's a female doctor and she was uh, having a conversation with her on the phone. And uh, Shannon had said, Yeah, I, I get it. Like, you um, have never had an employee before and this is challenging for you. And she goes, No, 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 you don't understand. I've never had a job before. <laughs> I, my whole life, I went to school. My job was to get good grades. Then I went to college. Then I uh, went to grad school. Then I went to med. It's like, I, yeah. and I, I've never had a job. And so it's not even a matter of understanding how to connect with people as an employer. It's not even understanding what they want and how they should feel. And there's a whole different mindset around it. Mm-hmm. So you having to come in and do that makes it really challenging. So what, besides the, the everything from A to Z, um, is that mainly the thing that like you, that's that kind of you specialize in, that you stand out in uh, amongst a crowd of other consultants that are out there? Yeah, yes, absolutely. That and the playbooks that I have, you know, that, that how do you run an orthodontic office and practice and business? Um, I know that every practice's reality is different and that's sure. key. We have all of this the playbook, if you will, orthodontics, you know, 101 through, you know, 310. Uh-huh. But um, it also the ability to understand that office A is going to be a very different reality than office B, than office C and take that, you know, oftentimes I'm taking my playbooks that might be the financial coordinator and the scheduling coordinator, and I'm combining pieces of that, and I'm creating Julie's manual. Mm. You know, uh, the way I look at it is I want to come in and sit down at this, any desk in this practice, pull out this playbook, open it up, and say, hey, this is what I do. This is what I say. This is what letter I send. This is how I do it. Um, and having never sat down in your office before. And actually, you know, if doctors recognize how important that was, it's very costly for practices to uh, bring on new team members and or replace existing team members. 100%, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's a huge expense when you are hiring incorrectly or if you have to replace somebody. Uh, again, I love that your, your, uh, your flow your um, ideas or your playbook, going back to the sports analogy, it's funny when you said it, like I'm, I'm totally deficient of the sports gene. That was not how 
I, I did stuff. I, I don't care about sports, but uh, when it comes to business, I use sports analogies all the time because, uh, boy, if we're not keeping score, why are we playing? If we either get to, and, and when it comes to team members, right? Like we win or lose as a team. You can't have one rock star and expect that that's going to take the whole thing. You're going to win some games. You're not going to win the championship. Absolutely. So. You know, I, I say it all the time. It doesn't start and stop with the treatment coordinator. There's so much focus put on the TC. And of course, absolutely, they're in a very influential position. But as you stated in the beginning, you're either in sales or you're in sales support. I love that. And that's that team synergy. TC cannot be as effective if they don't have the scheduling team laying the foundation for that same day start. Yep. Um, if they don't have that coordination or that dance with the doctor and the treatment recommendations and the presumptive close, you know, if we don't have the clinical team acting as educators. And I know I, I always love our conversations and discussions and we're going off a little bit onto a side road here, but um, we were going to talk about how to grow uh -huh. practices yep. and tap into your chair side technicians as educators and influencers uh, with a simple conversation chair side with a parent. Yep. You're converting your parents. And yep. if passion is involved, it's not high pressure sales. So, you know, I have doctors will say, you know, Michelle, I've got two chair side technicians that are fantastic communicators. And I've got two that can't communicate at all. And I said, well, do they give oral hygiene instructions? Well, yes. Do they give expander instructions? Yes. That's because they do it all day, every day. So yeah. let's get this conversation role played and comfortable, put mm -hmm. it on their radar, what we're looking for them to recognize the impact they have on our patients. Simply asking, you know, when you're working on, you know, Sally and we're gloved up and masked up and nowadays we're double masked. No, yeah, <laughs> but, <yeah>. um, <laughs> um, and just talking to mom and saying, you know, mom, do you still wear your retainers? You believe in lifetime retainer wear and based on whatever answer she'll provide, you can say, you know, we can put your teeth back in the same position they were in when you got your braces off. We could do it with clear aligners. We have a great family care program, hand over a brochure and say, let us know when you're ready. We'll take great care of you. There is nothing high pressure sales about that. It's an authentic, passionate conversation. conversation. That's right. And well, that's the thing, right? Where that's the full team approach is about really understanding that everyone has that responsibility and opportunity. It's about connection. Look, yes. do you want your chair side people to connect with your team or do you want just to sit there and be yes. silent? Like you have to have these conversations. And I love that you said that the poisonous word in so many practices, which baffles me is, role play yeah. like that people aren't role playing these things and understanding how to have these conversations or how to ask the question that brings in the conversation that mm -hmm. make it authentic like it, it is so fascinating that in any going back to sports analogy you're not just gonna go and try to play the game you got to practice before the game so you know what to do you know what your position is you know how to approach the challenge that happens um i i think it's so vital for us to be thinking along those lines and to break it down in bite-sized chunks for people to understand and consume right. it. Right. So much easier. And it, it arms them with the comfort because it's yes. not natural yeah. for everybody. I understand that. But the more we just, even you don't have to sit up on high bar stools with the spotlight on you. I mean, right. we're just sitting around our lunch table. We're just role yep. playing and dialoguing, yep. going back and practicing as, as the other team members also observe. I do this a lot in my sales um, training and presumptive close with TCs. I, you know, others will watch what this is and they're providing their own feedback on what they're seeing as well. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that process, they're learning. Right. So it just is a really comprehensive way um, for it to get comfortable uh, internally for, for team members. So it's necessary. Yeah, it absolutely. is necessary. It's the only way that you will grow your practice, by the way, as a doctor, as someone who's listening to this and you're thinking about this, you would much rather, I know you would, I'm not going to ask the question, but you would much rather have, uh, people supporting you, helping you, pushing you up the hill sometimes, as opposed to you trying to drag everybody up the hill, you would much rather have that. And that's the only way to grow your practice. If you're talking about scalability, you're only one person. Mm -hmm. You have to look at everybody else in your office as a asset to helping you grow that practice. And by the way, that goes back to what Michelle was saying earlier too. If that asset's numbers are not panning out, you gotta be willing to let them go and put something in that, somebody in that position who Amen. will 
help you be an asset. And you got to be brave enough. You got to love them enough. I use this analogy a lot, and I know that you're on the same page of this is, man, if you have somebody in your office who you really wish would quit, <laughs> then you're not loving them enough to actually invite them to another job. You're the problem. It's not them. Because they're just doing their thing, right? They're, and you've seen this before where you have a doctor who's like, oh, Sally or whoever it is, right? And you're thinking, well, why, why are you putting up with that, number one? And why are you not letting them go? Like, what, what's wrong I, with you? I, loving them enough to invite them to another job. I, That's it's right. Perfect. You know, because in that situation as well, it's, it's not an ideal situation for all of the other team no, members. No, of course not. It's, so, oh, yes, exactly. You know, back to what we were talking about, tapping into each team member. I, yeah. I really recommend empowering each team member in every position to be the driver of the appointments and of what their role is to those appointments. I don't want an assistant to simply be an assistant to the appointment. Right. I don't want a treatment coordinator simply be an assistant to the exam. Mm -hmm. I really want those team members to have the tools to really drive what that appointment is as an educator and an influencer. Well, let's talk about how do you empower them to do so? Because um, I know that I, there are doctors out there saying, yeah, I feel like I, I, I know there's plenty of doctors there, especially in the sales position when it comes to the exam of like, they feel like they have to be the sales thing. They're the show, right? Everybody's there to see the doctor. How do you <laughs> empower or help the, uh, the TC become empowered or the clinical assistant become empowered to drive that exam or that appointment? Yeah, it's a definitely a trusted relationship. And what I find is the more the doctor experiences that this person, one, is the right person in the position, and two, has the skill set to be able to be that extension of the doctor, it, it slowly becomes a trusted relationship that we then put signals in place to where we, I'm going to back up a little bit. It's first coming up with an agreement and a, and a dialogue with the doctor to say, mm -hmm. this is our desire. I, I always circle back to what's the why. Mm -hmm. This is our desire. We do, we need you also in all these other different places in the practice at this time, come in, do your key piece to that exam. And then the TC will be that extension. So let's talk about what you need as a signal. Is it the TC to stand up? Is it the TC to um, flip the computer screen around? What are those signals that you can recognize that now it's time to pass the baton in this appointment? So when the doctor is a part of that dialogue and helping to come up with what that solution or those steps are gonna be, it's a lot easier to facilitate it. And then it's just continue to support and empower the treatment coordinator in this example to keep doing it don't don't do it once or twice and it doesn't work and give up keep right. doing it and it's trained behavior that we will uh change well yeah i love that you use the word steps right like what steps we're taking it's it is a choreographed dance and not all dances are great the first time you got to <laughs> learn it you gotta yeah. you are you're, you're dancing with the tc you're dancing with yeah. the associate uh, I had a doctor once who was very clear, who just said, look, I believe my only three jobs are to create treatment plans, make sure the treatment plan is being followed and make moms happy. And so in order to do that, I have got to make sure that my assistants are taking charge of that exam so that when they give them instruction, they hear it. They don't just think it's white noise unless the doctor says it. Absolutely. It's so important to do so. Yes. So let's talk about some real world results that you're able to um to help some practice owners give us a story of a practice owner that really was in need of some help and it didn't take that much but the what you did do caused a huge difference because i believe it's the small things that add up to the big things it's not usually just one big thing it's not one person in your office that's a pain in the butt it's not you know just a matter of being bad right. with follow-up it's one it's little things mm -hmm. and it's interesting that you say that because my experience has been by the time doctors call me they're feeling a sense of pain somewhere sure right? mm -hmm. and what what I definitely um, am aware of and recognize is by the time they're feeling that pain, there's a lot of bigger stuff going on under the surface. Yeah. So, uh, and typically it's pretty different than what the original, you know, phone call is about. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, gosh, 
there are there's so many different times when, and I don't, I mean, it bring me to tears because they become such good friends of mine and mm. I feel so vested in the success of our clients practices, but I've just had, I, I think probably overall, and I can't think of just one right now specifically, but overall I have a group and people that have come to me afterwards that have said, you've just said, shed such light that mm. I feel so much relief and so much pressure taken off of me. And I'm able to trust that my business is doing really well because we have all of these accountability pieces in place and I don't have to manage or lead my practice out of fear. So many times doctors so are keeping important. team members on that are sabotaging their practice and are so detrimental to their business because they're managing out of fear. Yeah. And when you have those foundations, the team in your corner supporting you and backing you, those playbooks and that accountability, you don't have to manage out of fear, or run your business out of fear. You can be confident in it. Um, and knowing that the balls aren't going to get dropped and focus on hiring the right person because then we have the tools to be able to put in their hand to be successful. I think it's so, such an important message, right? And when you are doing anything, really anything in your life, but especially in your practice and your relationships out of fear, you're right. already losing. You're yeah. already losing because you, it's, it's that thing that you think about every single day and night. It's the thing that keeps you up. Right. right, where if you're uh, practicing out of fear or freedom, those are the two choices. You get oh, yeah. fear or freedom. That's it. I love that word. It, it's just, it, 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 well, it's that, yeah, absolutely. It's that thing of, you know, we have so much bandwidth in our head. I always talk about this and, and you know, this is a parent, right? I have three kids. Yeah. There's that moment where it's like, I, 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 I really <laughs> can't take in anymore, right? And so if you have that bandwidth full, you mm -hmm. are a slave to whatever's going on there. But if you're able to delegate those things over, hire the right people, as you said, have people who are willing to help you be held accountable, then all of a sudden that piece is up here. I, I equate it to working out, right? I've, I'm working out quite a bit lately and mm -hmm. uh, I work out in the mornings because yeah. when I do the morning workout, yes. even though it's a pain in the butt, even though I'm tired, I'm done. And I can spend yeah. the rest of the day but when I do the thing where I'm like, oh, I'm going to go work out tonight, my whole day is thought around like, okay, when am I going to do that? I got to make sure I get the time. I got to... It's my, my bandwidth is taken up now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it was, I think it's Robert Allen has a book called uh, Eat the Frog First, where the whole idea is like, do the worst thing you got to do in the morning, oh, get that yeah. done, because then the rest of the day is free. Like yes. you're free. So I, I think it's important. Um, okay. So let's talk about this. What, it, I, what I'm always curious about is entropy. When it comes to anything we learn, there is a, there's entropy that happens to all of us, whether it be in our relationships, whether it be in uh, the way that we you know, eat, if we're not like, being held accountable, but in businesses for sure. So someone hires Michelle Shimon Consulting, they go through the process, they're getting great results, cut two, three years, four years, five years later. How do they keep that um that act sharp um so we, yeah we actually we stay on our clients typically don't want to let us go which Good. so feel so great about that it's the best compliment ever yeah that's so awesome. we do stay on as a support to our our clients in that sense but probably most importantly dino what was left behind from their consulting experience with a firm? Mm. So what tools do they still have? Because as consultants, as you know, we can go into practices and we can get anything done when we're there. Sure. What are we leaving behind that are tangibles for this team? Whether okay. you're there, you know, you do a lot of training videos, whether they're, you know, the training videos, we've got training videos that we leave in their hands that are tangible yep. Um, yep. resources as refreshers to their team, as fantastic resources for onboarding new team members. So that consistency. And then, of course, it's uh, natural and necessary to have refreshers as well, freshen things up. This is why annual meetings that practices take their teams to, they're just really great, um, enthusiastic times to energize the team right. again. So those yeah. are very, very important. It's a consistent mindset in investing in your team members. 
And when your team members feel that you are investing in them as not only individuals, but as team members for the practice as well, they perform better. It's studies everywhere yep, uh, yep. Have, have found those results. So that's, that's the key ingredient to the success of any partnership, I feel. Well, wait a minute, Michelle. You were supposed to give us some really large algorithm and <laughs> some really challenging, right? Like, we're so Not often rocket we're, science, right? So often we're walking over the dollars to get to the dimes. It's like just, right. it's, it's the, con, being consistent, schedule those trainings, schedule those times right. to, to get back to the basics. It's so right. valuable. Yeah. All right. So uh, where else are you seeing that there's a lack of leadership when it comes to enrolling the entire team to understand that they're responsible for helping grow this practice? Where is a broken link? Yeah. I've, when, when practices put office managers in place simply to have an office manager and they're the wrong office manager. Oh, wow, that's so good. Doctors, I, I respect, and it's very valuable that they recognize that this might not be their strong suit. They might not simply want to have to take on that role as they shouldn't have to. I prefer they focus on, uh, you know, providing the best care to patients and then living their best life outside of the office as well. Sure. It's important. Um, so to recognize that we want an office manager leader in place, but simply putting somebody in there to put them in there can be, uh, have the opposite effects on the business itself. And then I feel like it's a cycle that they get into the wrong people. It's detrimental to the rest of the team. We don't have the right people. And it just, then we're managing out of fear and this, I can't let this office manager go because they're the only person that knows how to do everything. Yes. Um, and it's just this vicious cycle that you need to step out of, get off that roller coaster, recalibrate what you're going to now do to, to recalibrate your business and your internal culture. And that might mean letting a, a person go that is in the wrong position in the business. A lot of times office managers that are put in that role uh, don't look at management and leadership as that of a service position. I mean, I say that, you know, leadership and management role, they should be the first in, the last out. As an office manager in heels and a suit, I would go out to my treatment area and say, guys, go to lunch. You guys have been working so fast and hard this morning. High fives all around. Great job. I'm going to turn all your chairs around. I am going to reset up for you after lunch. Everything will be ready. I got you. And mm -hmm. it's, it's serving others outside service. of yep. service. It's serving others outside of your position. Um, leading by example, and that in and of itself can turn a culture around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. So uh, let's back up for just a moment then. Say I'm a doctor and I'm thinking about bringing on an office manager. Um, I think there are uh, valid reasons for doing so. I also think there are sometimes doctors who do it because they just don't want to deal with stuff, right? Absolutely. They, they want to they want to relegate. They don't want to delegate, right? And just be like, mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with this anymore. So let's have somebody else do all this stuff. What is the first step? If somebody's out there right now, driving in their car or on the treadmill, and they're thinking, you know what? I have been thinking about getting an office manager. What is the first step that they should do in your mind and your and your trainings to to take that step forward? Uh, well, there's a couple channels you could take. Uh, I do like to look internally with. A team member internally. So there's two pieces to this. If they have one, how do I turn it? Or it's not working. How do I turn it around? Or if I don't have one, how do I start with that role um, and implementing that? I would, if we're looking internally first, look to see who is a team member that looks proactively for solutions, mm -hmm. looks at challenges and problems as opportunities. Somebody who is a positive force, positive energy, um, somebody that serves and ha humility is key uh, and a level of arrogance and dictatorship does not work. And it's often so common by the time you get to that yeah, uh, manager position. Yep. So I look for that humility and it's so easy to train and coach and guide an individual to be able to enforce a level of authority 
yet you can do it with humility. Mm -hmm. Part of my lecture again this last weekend, kindness in business is so under uh, underrated yes. and underutilized. And, you know, I, I, I use this example when I lectured, when I'm, when I was coaching my little, my kids, when they were little, who are now fully grown, but when they were little, I can train them and discipline them with kind words. I can say, you know, please don't do that. That is not okay. I need you to stop doing that. As opposed to what I would witness and still often witness out and about, don't do that. Stop doing that. Get down, get off. You know, there's just a difference in your tone and people learn through demonstrated behavior. Sure, and sure. so depending how, how, you know, I can hold team members accountable. I can be kind about it. Delegation is not abdicating authority by any means, you know, um, give the team members their lane, give them the tools, give them the accountability and be able to measure their success. But most importantly, and this is how I train in review processes, review processes are, should simply not be a discussion where we sit down and we say, yep, you're doing really good. Sounds great. Here, right. let me give you a 50 cent raise or a dollar 50 raise. Oh my gosh. That's not a review process. The review process should be a coaching session. We should be developing our team members in this process. And it should be a dialogue with team members that they are engaged in. Yep, and yep. not simply talking at them, but say, what did you accomplish last year? What are you looking to accomplish this year? Fantastic. What do you think you need to accomplish that? How can I support your success in that? This is a dialogue in a review process that is going to facilitate team members desiring to grow and develop themselves professionally, which will benefit your practice and your business. 100% agree. I often talk about how I think every single person in the world uh, needs real three things to thrive, that you see me, that you hear me, and what I say matters. And if you create that situation where it's just you're being talked at all the time or that you f they feel like their opinion doesn't matter it doesn't mean that you're going to do everything that they say to do but at least be heard that mm -hmm. they're seen as human beings as people who are waking up every single day to make your dream come true yes like treat yes. them like that and yes. they'll do it and yes. it's just such wise words. I love it. Thank you, Michelle. Man, we could literally talk for hours. You know this. We have before. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to thank you so much for your time and sharing today. We have come to a part in our show where we go through the six questions that are just kind of rapid fire off the top of your head uh, answers. Are you ready to play? I'm terrible at Jeopardy because I'm terrible at this uh, <laughs> rapid. I'll do my best. Let's do this. All I right. Gotcha. Okay. What do you think is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing in their practice? Like financially expensive? Well, it could be or financially. Possibly. It could be at, I have people who say things like equipment or people or opportunities or. The most, exp I would say um, understanding and comprehension. Them not understanding what's not being done in the practice is costing them a lot of money. So uh, blind eyes. Absolutely. Blind, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I just, if it, a $1.5 million practice, if their delinquency is at 28%, uh -huh. that's $460,000. And they, if they bring that down to 4%, it's like $360,000 difference that they're bringing in. And it's just an aware, a lack of awareness or, mm. um, you know, understanding the impact. Look yeah. internally. Up looking externally for the answers to growing your practice. What's that saying? If you think education is expensive, so we can right. say that if you think consulting is expensive, uh, what's if you think it's what happens if I invest, yeah, what stupidity. happens if I invest in my employees and they leave? Yeah. What happens if you don't invest in your employees and they stay? That's right. hundred uh, percent. What's a book that you believe every private practice owner should be reading? I promise you are not paying me for this. There's this book, Ortho RX. They absolutely have to read. I think, and I again, I know this is a, such a fantastic book of yours. But um, the Practice I, RX. Practice RX. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I was, yes. Yeah. Practice RX. Oh, um, it and you and I are so similar in understanding the value of the culture and the leadership. I think that's literally why it speaks to me so 
profoundly. Wow. Um, books on leadership and service are key. I love Richard Branson's philosophy on investing and building your team members. Mm -hmm. If you take care of your team members, they take care of your patients, clients, you know, customers. And that I see that philosophy on a daily basis. Yeah, it's so true. And um, I thank you. That's very sweet of you. I never I wasn't planning on that, especially with the next question being in that book. You know, you know, I do talk about culture and team, uh, yeah. team uh, performance as the foundation for business growth. So as you're in these offices, like you said, on a daily basis, as you're talking to the doctors, where do you see is the biggest challenge that they're facing when it comes to their teams and office culture? Um, having the skill set to make the change or la- lacking the skill set to make the change. Um, stepping outside of that fear that we talked about earlier Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and having the ability to be able to, I'm going to say deal with, but deal with challenging employees and team members. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's that, and it takes training, right? It's a muscle that needs to be strengthened and it's, it's not always easy at first, but I promise just like anything, it's going to get easier. So and most of the time people don't want to have, you said it takes training. People don't want to have to deal with that. So they have a tendency to just turn the blind eye. Yep. And it's this cyclical challenge that we deal with. Well, it's uh, so Amy Walker, my vice president of sales and marketing, she has this great quote that she says, um, a, uh, a frustration in any relationship unaddressed and unaddressed frustration never gets smaller. Right. It's like right. They, if you have something you don't know how to do and you're frustrated about, it, it's not going to get better by ignoring it or by not dealing with it. It never gets better. Um, before we get on to the next two questions, how can people reach out to you and, and, and connect with you? Yeah. The fastest way um, through many different channels, go to my website, ortho-consulting.com or orthoconsulting.com. Either way, you can reach me directly through email, my cell, my personal cell phone. You can reach my team best way to reach me is going through my website at orthoconsulting.com. Nice. Very good. All right. What's the best advice that you've ever received in life or in business? Hmm. Best advice I've ever received. I'm I'm probably convoluting it with the advice that I give. (laughs) (laughs) The best advice. I, I think actually what always sticks in my mind and what I really focus again, I think Richard Branson's philosophy, invest in your team and they will take care of your patients, clients, customers. And I, you know, I I did speak about my team earlier. I I do wish if I can figure out how to do this, I really do wish I can give kind of an insight view of how Shimon Consulting internally runs because my team and it's an insider joke with their oftentimes they're like, Hey, shell stay in your lane. That's not your lane. I'm like, Oh, you're right. You guys, sorry. And as a very um, dominant strong-willed business owner, it's easy for me to feel like I have to be involved yeah. in everything. And I, I try on a daily basis to, to live what I preach. And I have seen team members that I have with me develop unbelievably and on a daily basis. And last week I was on the road and we have a full team text message that was starting to go around. And I just sat back and listened and watched what was going on, but the empowerment of each team member and the encouragement and what they were saying, I felt like a proud mama. Like it was unbelievable (laughs) how, how amazing it felt. So it works. I feel it's worked for me. I've seen it work for a lot of practices. That is probably the loudest, um, advice that I, when I look at business that I, it sticks with me, resonates with me loudly. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. What is the best resource or tool that every pri- uh, private practice owner should be using to grow their practice that they're not? I stop looking external for the answers to grow your practice and look at your internal, you know, um, the calls I get to say, I need more marketing. I need more new patient exams. Look and evaluate what you're leaving on the table internally already. Yeah. We've already talked about, uh, you know, an understanding how to assess the financial department in your business and practice. Um, you know, I was in a practice one time where they had this bonus system set up that had been set up from another consultant and, uh, you know, long ago. And they, 
we're bonusing. They're making this bonus. But then I'm like, you're collecting and producing less than you did last year. How is this bonus set up to be able to, but you know, the team members are, are making their bonus. So it's understanding the business side of orthodontics and, and really what makes sense um, all around. So don't get me started on the whole bonus thing. It's, it's fascinating <laughs> to me. It's Let's like, do another podcast on goals yeah. and bonuses. Oh, wait. So I'm going to give you more money for doing your job. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, don't, don't get me started. Okay. So uh, not that they're bad. It's just perspective of when you do. Well, again, yeah, just, do just, yes. what's that? And how you do it. And how you do it. Absolutely. Well, again, just thank you for the amazing information you gave us. I know everybody who is listening was uplifted and enhanced in their mindset through understanding a little bit more about how they can enroll their entire team on becoming a part of the growth of that practice, helping them understand that they truly are uh, the driving force in the, the, the uh, business growing and succeeding. And that's so crucial. So thank you so much, Michelle, for spending some time with us. It's always a pleasure, Dino. I, I just, you're a remarkable influence in our industry and I'm grateful to have the opportunity for this as well. So thank you. Oh, you're so sweet. I appreciate that. Everyone listening uh, to the show, thank you again for being listeners, for tuning into us and downloading us and subscribing to us. It really means a lot to us and we're grateful to have you here. And our goal is always to bring you the best practices for every practice. And it doesn't matter what type of practice you're in, whether you're in orthodontics or dental or uh, plastic surgery. If you are listening to this podcast, you know you're getting tidbits that can help you out in any uh, practice whatsoever. Again, make sure you share this with your friends and colleagues. And uh, remember that our goal here is always to help you be more proactive, productive, and profitable in all areas of your life and business. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much again for listening to the ProPreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.